When Simon Whitelock set out to answer a simple childish question, how many cylinders can you stuff into a motorcycle? He did not reach for subtlety. He reached for spectacle. What began as a hobbyist's fascination with Kawasaki two-stroke triples and a habit of jamming engines together for fun evolved into a project with the seriousness of engineering and the bravado of theater. Over decades of small, escalating experiments, he moved from converting a triple into an inline four to a nine-cylinder triple-triple to a seven-in-line oddity, and finally to a machine that reads like a challenge to common sense. A 48-cylinder, 4.2-liter two-stroke motorcycle engine mounted in a rolling chassis, crowned by a tiny 125cc donkey motor that starts the whole Leviathan. People laughed, then stared, then applauded. Whitelock wanted a world record, and he built one. The idea was simple, yet bringing it to life demanded an extraordinary level of ingenuity and precision. Whitelock chose Kawasaki KH250 triples as his raw material because they were plentiful, cheap, and mechanically compatible enough to be coaxed into marriage. Sixteen of those triples provided the raw cylinders. Mechanically stitching them together into six banks of eight cylinders each required custom machining, custom castings, and a mountain of patience. The layout is almost absurd in its geometry. Eight cylinders in a line, then another eight beside them, and so on until the engine stretches like a miniature airliner fuselage. There is a 49th cylinder in the package, but it is not there to make performance claims. It is a 125cc single bolted on as a starter, a humble donkey engine that spins the vast mass until the main 48 cylinders catch and roar. If you try to imagine the scale, imagine a regular 250cc two-stroke triple multiplied by 16 and then welded into one breathing block. The nominal displacement is about 4,200 cubic centimeters. Stock KH250SS were rated in the low 30s of horsepower, so if you multiply for fun, you could theorize a massive number. Whitelock himself was blunt about the point. It's not made for speed. It was made to get in the Guinness Book of Records, he explained. He estimated its top speed at around 120 to 130 miles per hour, roughly 200 kilometers an hour, though it was never tested on a dyno. Practical power and usable torque maps were secondary to the aim of proving the engineering could be done. Fitting the rest of the motorcycle to the engine took the same same-minded improvisation. There is no off-the-shelf frame long enough or strong enough, so Whitelock fabricated his own to cradle the six engine banks and everything they required. The weight is staggering for a two-wheeler, roughly 600 kilograms or about 1,300 pounds. To manage that mass, he borrowed proven heavy motorcycle components. A front end from a Honda Goldwing to get reasonable forks and brakes, a BMW K100 gearbox known for durability, and heavy-duty Hagon wheels spoked with the stoutest stainless available. The tank that appears to sit over the engine is not a traditional fuel tank, but a stretched KH250 shell used as a cover for ignition and electronics. The real fuel reservoir is a stainless tube running between lower banks, feeding a complex network of lines. The intake and ignition architecture had to be elegant and simple enough to be manageable. Whitelock grouped cylinders into banks, each bank having its own carburetor setup and spark control. He fitted one carburetor per bank rather than one per cylinder, which simplified plumbing and tuning to a degree, and he designed a throttle splitter so a single twist of the wrist could open multiple carburetors in concert. He admitted with a grin that the throttle requires some force, but it's usable. The exhaust system became a practical nightmare. With 48 cylinders producing raw two-stroke exhaust, the solution was to merge outlets gradually, welding manifolds in sections to avoid warping, and finally routing the whole lot into two collectors, one on each side. The effect of those collectors when the engine is fired is thunder more than noise. Building the thing was not a neat, linear process. The project dragged over several years with most of the detailed, tedious work compressed into a final push. Whitelock started the concept work around 1998 and finished in about 2003. There were fabrication headaches that would have broken less stubborn people, 
Welding the exhaust, for instance, could warp adjacent sections, so manifolds had to be built in stages and fitted to each other with surgical care. Plumbing the fuel and ignition systems so that banks of cylinders fired in unison required patience and repeated trial and error. Heat management was also a concern. Although largely air-cooled by design, the machine received a small liquid cooling loop to help with repeated cold starts and heat soak, and Whitelock carved out space for alternators, batteries, and amplifier boards under covers and inside widened body panels. Startup was the ritual everyone wanted to see. The procedure begins with the donkey engine, a small single that spins the monstrous crank until compression and timing across the banks allow the 48 cylinders to light. The first time Whitelock managed that, he said the sound reminded him of an aircraft engine. That image, a bike that sounds like a bomber and exhales blue clouds, became part of the legend. But starting and keeping the engine running was finicky. In later years during auction preparations, the machine would occasionally fire up and then stall, pointing to a likely misadjusted jet or a carburetion hiccup among the many carburetors. Whitelock has been practical about that. He helps buyers learn how to coax the bike to life because it is as much a mechanical curiosity as it is a functioning vehicle. Ergonomics and usability were never strengths, and Whitelock accepted that candidly. The bike's seating and reach are comically wrong for conventional riding. The wheelbase mass and balance make it a machine for slow parade riding, for showing and for demonstrating raw mechanical accomplishment rather than corner carving. Panels would slip and fittings would loosen during initial trials, a reminder that novelty constrained the boundary between prototype and roadworthy machine. Yet the bike was made road legal in the UK, passing the inspections required for a home-built machine, and that alone is a testament to the thoroughness of the work. The achievement was concrete. The Tinker Toy was certified by Guinness as the vehicle engine with the most cylinders. For a builder who started in backyard workshops and local club rallies, that certification was vindication. Whitelock never hid the motive. He wanted the record, and the machine's specifications and runnings earned it. Videos of startup clips and measured runs circulated widely and the public reaction was intense. Viewers labeled it one of the craziest builds in motorcycling history, amazed more by the size and audacity than by any practical performance metric. Drop your thoughts in the comments below, we'd love to hear your take. If you enjoyed this video and want to dive deeper into the history and evolution of legendary motorcycles, from vintage Hondas to cutting-edge hyperbikes, Make sure to like, share, and subscribe to SK for more exciting content. Ride safe, dream big, and stay tuned for our next story. Goodbye.